Hi and welcome to Midnight Cry, a program that is committed to speaking the truth in love. I'm your host, Romul Gassane, and today we have with us Beth Grove, who will be discussing with us the very important subject of the position of women before and after Islam was established. First of all, welcome to the show, Beth. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No, thank you for coming. And I, I feel like I've been learning so much. And I know that our viewers, as they do watch these episodes, they will find that these episodes are truly engaging. Now, you've heard what the topic is for today. And I think this is one that is really important both to Muslims and to Christians, because really, when we talk about a religion, we're able to see the depth of it its truth in how it treats its people, mm -hmm. especially how it treats females. Mm -hmm. Now, it's often said that when Islam did come in, that it actually elevated women. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you, is that assumption true? Well, a lot of Muslims claim that Islam elevated the position of women, and that's why we look, we're going to look at um, what the position of women was before Islam and after Islam. Mm. But a simple answer to that is, well, it really didn't elevate the position of women. Um, I can't make that claim without supporting that. Uh, but it's not me who's actually beginning to throw this idea out. A lot of um, some Muslim scholars themselves are beginning to recognize that the position of women um, after Islam was actually not as good in some ways as it was before Islam. And there's uh, a group of scholars, Muslim scholars, and uh, one word to call them would be modernist scholars or feminist Muslim scholars, progressive Muslim scholars. There's different titles that people call them. But these modernist Muslim scholars have begun to say, well, actually, the time before um, Muhammad and the, the women who lived in the time before Muhammad had a lot more freedoms than the women who lived in the time after Muhammad. So that we want to just look at, at that a little bit today. Yes. Now, we refer to these in two particular terms, and I believe if I pronounce it correctly, it's Jalia and also Rushadun. And so the Jalia was the period of ignorance before prior, Islam. Is yes, that right? Yes. yes. So you have the Jahiliya before Islam, and uh, what modernist Muslim, well, what many Muslim scholars do is refer back to this time of ignorance, mm. and um, they say, "See what happened in the time of ignorance," and then they move it forward to the time of the Rashidun period. And the Rashidun period, which is the golden age of Islam, and the golden age of Islam is really um, when Muhammad became an established a prophet, and then it's, it's the first of four rightly guided caliphs after him, and those would be people like Abu Bakr. These were the first leaders of Islam, for those who don't understand what caliph means. And there was Abu Bakr, there was Umar, there was Uthman, there was Ali. And Ali died in 661. And that's really when this golden age um, sort of ended. Now, of course, that's Sunni Muslims who believe that, because Shia Muslims uh, don't follow um, all of the companions of Muhammad. Shia, Shiite Muslims would actually uh, follow uh, Muhammad and then Ali and, and the family of Muhammad. Uh, but the majority of Muslims, which is probably 90%, um, if about 90% of Muslims would follow a Sunni form of Islam, and it would be this golden age that they would look at, yes. uh, that all Muslims need to go back to. Yes, and so some Muslims do claim that there was this terrible practice in which uh, if uh, parents had a child, especially if she was a female because they saw her as an expense, as a cost, mm -hmm. as a liability, S the practice was that they would actually kill that mm -hmm. female, that child, mm -hmm. that baby. And when Islam did come into effect and when it was est established, they eradicated this practice. Is that true? It probably is true. I mean, we don't have as much writing about the time or the formation of Islam as we do, say, for Christianity. So um, it, we don't necessarily know uh, what exactly happened or what didn't happen. But there's enough evidence to say that probably did happen. And it certainly happens even today in tribal kind of cultures. And Muhammad came from a very tribal kind of um, uh, Arabian culture. And so we know it happens in, in Africa. It, we have stories coming out of Af Afghanistan. It still is happening today. Mm. So yes, it probably did happen. But the question that I want to ask is, yes, that's a good thing if, if certainly infanticide of, or killing of female children was stopped. But 
actually we need to take that question a step further and say, well, what about the status of women? Mm. Okay, it's great if someone stops children being killed, but what is the status of women? And what many Muslim scholars do is they go back to this idea of infanticide and it comes up over and over again in the writings of Muslim scholars. But we have to find out, well, let's look at the, sta the status of women. What did Muhammad do for the status of women? Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, when, when you mention that, I'm thinking now in my mind that Okay, the best way to look at it is through the wives mm -hmm. of the leader of this religion, uh, the prophet of this religion, if we're able to look at how he treated his own wives uh, before Islam and before he knew he was a prophet and so on, and some of the wives afterwards, maybe that would help us to better determine uh, was there an increase or an elevation in the status of women? And that's exactly what Muslim scholars do. Muslim scholars will go back to um, a number of the wives, but two of the wives that are quite important would okay. be Khadija. She, she is his first wife. And then the other wife that is important is Aisha. And what she has become to know, be known as his favorite wife. Now, a lot of people say, oh, no, 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 not favorite, because um, a, a Muslim man is supposed to love all wives the same. Equally, yes. Yeah. And, okay. uh, but we know, actually, from the stories of um, Al-Bahari and uh, many of the traditions from the biography of Muhammad, uh, we know that Aisha did uh, was the favored wife of of Muhammad, and we'll look at that a bit later. Uh, but what is important to look at these two wives uh, is that what many Muslim, mod especially modernist Muslim scholars do is they go to Khadija. They look at Khadija. Khadija, she was this woman of business. She was Muhammad's first wife. She was 15 years older. Uh, she was a woman of wealth. She had property. Uh, she had influence. She was Muhammad's boss. And uh, she was a, a free woman. She, really, she made her own decisions. She was a very independent woman. And so Muslims say, see, that's, that is the Islamic and woman. And I suppose it wasn't like an arranged marriage as mm. such. Mm. Did she have freedom in, in choosing him? Well, certainly she she most likely did. And certainly she was a woman of power and much more um, in much more position or power of position, a position of power, excuse me, than Muhammad. And so uh, that we know that women uh, in the Jahiliya, in the in the days of, of the ignorant days of ignorance, that uh, they had a lot more freedom to choose who they wanted to marry mm. and to choose when they when they left the home. They didn't have to ask permission to leave the home. They didn't have to veil. So Khadija really represents that kind of woman. And what many Muslims don't understand is that Khadija, and some modernist Muslim scholars are admitting this now, Khadija actually, rec um, actually res re uh, is an example of the pre-Islamic woman. And what you have is um, some modernist Muslims like Leila Ahmad and um, uh, Fatima Munisi, other, other um, modernist Muslim scholars will say, actually, it's as Islam grew, then many more stipulations, many more boundaries, uh, many more guidelines and rules for the, first of all, the, the wives of Muhammad, and then um, for the rest of the Muslim believers. And that became became more of a reality for the Muslim woman and their freedoms became less and less. Mm. And so Khadija is actually a good example. But what I'm gauging from what you're saying is that she's really not the example we should be looking to because she was pre uh, Islam or the establishment of Islam anyway. Is, is that right? Yes. Um, in fact, if Muslims really want to go to a good example of a Muslim woman, they would need to go to um, Muhammad's other wives, including Aisha, uh, and e even looking at some of the wives and, of the companions and how the, the companions of Muhammad, those are the disciples of Muhammad, mm. um, treated their wives. But Aisha is the other example. And she's an interesting one to look at because Aisha represents uh, a woman who she had more freedom than some of the other wives. She was definitely loved very much by Muhammad. In fact, there's a story of one of the other wives becoming very upset because, uh, because he was favoring um, Aisha, uh, but she was very beautiful. She was his youngest wife. And so um, she doesn't even necessarily represent the, the average Muslim woman either or the rest of Muhammad's wives. But she did have a lot more uh, or a lot less freedoms than Khadija did and she was in, she was with the other wives when for example Muhammad um, Allah says that if if the wives don't start pleasing Muhammad then Allah will give him better better wives than um, than than them and Aisha yes. was included in that so uh, we see that story in 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 the Quran 
and then the hadith is expanded a lot more. And so she, her, she, in that she had to veil like the others, in that she had to be segregated from the men, uh, in, in that she, she couldn't just freely move about so much, um, shows that uh, she, she was becoming what the Islamic woman was, was going to become. Sure. Now, Beth, do you have some specific examples? I mean, you know, isn't Islam supposed to ennoble women? Well, you can look at um, stories from the Hadith, um, stories from the biography of Muhammad. Um, you can look at the Quran itself. And there is one little story in the Quran that begins to show us how um, whilst Muslims say that Muhammad ennobled the, the lives of women, even the, the lives of his wives, uh, when you read the Quran, you begin to wonder if he really did ennoble them. Was he protecting them? Was he loving him like, for example, the Bible says uh, that, um, that, uh, that Christian men are to, are to love their wives. And I just wanted to re read a little bit of a story here. It's in Surah 66 and it has a very interesting story that, that is really talked about a lot in the Hadith. Um, but we haven't got time to look at that tonight and uh, today. And so. Uh, in the story, it talks um, is probably talking about Hafsa and Aisha, and there's been a, a disagreement, and these two uh, women, ha these two wives, have upset Muhammad. And in uh, Surah 66, verse five, it says this: It says, "It may be that he, Muhammad, divorced you, that his Lord would give him instead of you better wives, wives better than you, Muslims, believers, obedient, turning to Allah in repentance, worshiping Allah sincerely, given to fasting." previously married and virgins. But it's this idea that um, God himself would give a verse in the Quran uh, to the wives of apparently the, the seal of all prophets, that this prophet could then divorce these women mm. and take on other women, married yes. or vir uh, ma previously married or virgins. And it's this idea that if Islam ennobled the position of women, there, there could not be a verse like this, because this is not ennoblement. Even Muhammad's wives were in this precarious position where they could be divorced by Allah's blessing. Uh, and so uh, even uh, just looking at stories like this begin to uh, make me and make other people begin to ask questions. Mm, this is not a God who ennobles uh, women. Yes, I think you rightly pointed it out is that as a woman, if you were married to him, you would feel afraid, uh, you know, yes. will he divorce me? Will I be shut out emotionally or, and so well, on? Well, we know um, from other verses, uh, Surah 434, uh, which we talked about uh, last week, and where it says that, um, that uh, righteous wives are devoutly obedient. And of course, if she's not devoutly obedient, then a discipline can happen. Mm. And uh, again, uh, that is not a protection for women. That puts women in a very precarious position. Yes. And so um, you, you wouldn't find anything like that in the Bible at all. Yes. So I think um, people need to start reading the Quran and taking it at face value and beginning to ask questions of the Quran, not just accepting it, uh, but beginning to question it. Yes. Well, what about Christianity? I mean, if we can now contrast that with Christianity, did Christianity elevate did it give status to women? Well, we know a lot more about what was happening at the time of Christianity, um, or the, 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 the birth of Christianity, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, or at least the time of Jesus and before that, because this was, uh, Jesus was born into the, the Roman Empire, and it was a, a mighty empire, and it, and it carried on for, for quite a few years yes. after Jesus was born. It, it was, uh, it, there, there were urban cities, there was a lot of writing, there was a lot of um, Greek thought still about, I mean, it was a very, sophisticated society and so we have a lot of material from that time and we know actually if you look at how Jesus treated women and interacted with women uh, that it, it was it was absolutely ennobling now some people might think well you're Christian you're biased Here you are critiquing the Quran and yes, now you're yes. saying oh look at the Bible it's wonderful <laughs> but then what we need to do is open the Bible we need to look at the Bible like we need to open the Quran and look at the Quran we need to look at the life of Muhammad we need to look at the life of Jesus and we need to try um, and just take it at face value. How does Jesus treat women? How does Muhammad treat women? And that's the easiest way to see if our two religions ennoble the position of women. Yes, and so are there some specific examples that we can look at there in Jesus' yes. time, his earthly ministry, mm -hmm 
whether he ennobled women or not. Well, there's a lot of examples we can look at. Um, we could be here all night, yes, <laughs> yes. And, uh, all day, looking at, 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 his, uh, at the examples. But uh, a favorite one of mine is probably, John, uh, is probably John, the book of John, which is um, written by one of Jesus' closest disciples, and that's chapter 4. And in, in, the, in chapter 4, it gives this story of a woman, it's a Samaritan woman, and she, she came from a people that was hated by the Jews. Uh, so one, why was Jesus a Jew talking to a Samaritan woman? Two, this woman was an immoral woman. In fact, Jesus knew that she was immoral. Jesus knew that she had had many husbands. And so why was he talking to an immoral woman? And then it, it seems like he was sitting at the well by himself talking to this woman at the well. And Jesus just talks to her um, and, and, ask, and asks her, um, can you give me a drink? And, and then in verse 10, um, and then, then the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for, for a drink? <laughs> for the Jews do not, so, do not associate, associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Mm. And then Jesus and this woman have this long discussion about what the living water is. And we know the living water is, I mean, is talking about God himself and Jesus is the source of the living water and how, basically how she was to be saved. This woman believed in Jesus and this woman went back to her village and told her village, this man knows everything about me, including her shameful life as well. Mm. And yet this and this man, and she led all of her, her village um, back to Jesus. She, she was actually the first missionary. She's the first yes. missionary mentioned in the Bible. There are many, many other stories. You have the story of, of Mary and Martha um, in Luke chapter 10, and Mary and Martha were friends of Jesus. These were Jesus's best friends uh, alongside Lazarus and alongside his disciples. And he was with these single women, talking with them, uh, teaching them. Uh, m men were not allowed to be in the presence of a woman like that, like any woman, and, and just teach them. Mm. And certainly a woman was not supposed to sit at a rabbi's feet and learn from a rabbi. Mm. And yet she was learning from Jesus the rabbi. And so Jesus was breaking all these cultural protocols. He was going above culture. He was showing women, I am God. This is how I value you. And so he put them into the position that women should be in. That's there are right. many, many other um, examples. The adulterous woman of John chapter 8, yes. who men were going to throw stones. And Jesus says that he who has not sinned cast the first stone. And then he, he he looked at the woman and he he basically forgave her and he reinstated her um, to uh, to a, a woman who would then be able to follow him. A forgiven one. A that's forgiven right. woman. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I think the example that you mentioned in uh, John four is such a pivotal example. You know, you, we know that Jesus went quite a distance to meet with this woman. Yeah. And you know, it's as though he had singled her out and he had gone there for that very purpose. I mean, we read in the Gospel of John chapter four, uh, as you mentioned, uh, and verse four, and we love, Christians love to say this, but he needed to go through Samaria. Mm -hmm. And he went there purposely for this woman. Yes. He knew, right? You know, he knew who was there. He knew why he was going there. And, you know, there was this huge racial barrier, as you had mentioned. And there is no way that an Orthodox Jew would want anything to do with Samaritans. Mm. And yet this God that we know, he is not prejudiced. Mm -hmm. He loves all people, whether Jew, Gentile, whatever race or whatever creed. And he goes to this woman and he has this conversation, as you mentioned, you know, with her. And rather than attacking her, rather than demeaning her, yeah, rather absolutely. than, you know, brushing her off as being an immoral woman, you know, he, he asks her in, in such a polite way, how many hus you know, how many, go and get your husband and bring him to me. And, you know, she says that, you know, uh, I don't have a husband. And so yeah. she wasn't being dishonest. And he goes, it's true, because he could see right into her heart. She had had five mm -hmm. and she was living with the six. But the amazing thing is, is that she met the seventh, mm -hmm. the perfect lover. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And that was the Lord Jesus, yeah, wasn't exactly. it? Yeah. You know, and it, I mean, you, you can say she was an immoral woman and perhaps she mm -hmm. was. But I think, you know, it is such a sad thing to see people go from one relationship to another, one broken relationship mm -hmm. to another. And he was Jesus who was restoring mm -hmm. 
the true relationship mm. which, mm. which was between mm. God and herself. And I think that is such a wonderful example. And exemplifying true love. Yes. And exemplifying platonic love. You yes. know, Jesus didn't look at this woman and, and um, take her on as a wife or a concubine or, or, or discipline her and, and abuse her mm. or stone her to death as, as um, others and other people would. Um, he reinstated her and showed her platonic, platonic as in non-sexual love, real love, godly love. I um, mean, Christianity, we say agape love. It's love beyond a human understanding mm. because he could take this woman and reinstate her. And it's a question I'd love to ask a lot of um, my Muslim friends and even Muslims who are watching this program. You know, would, what would Muhammad done with this woman? I don't think he would have reinstated her. And that's a question we must really um, ask of both, both these uh, the savior, as we call Jesus, and then Muhammad. You know, what would have Muhammad done to this woman? Would he have reinstated her? I don't think he would have done. Yes, yes. And so what we're able to see is that was there a change between, uh, you know, a pre-Islam and post-Islam? I shouldn't say post-Islam, but when Islam was established, was there a change? Was there an elevation to the status of women? And really, we really couldn't see that there was a difference. Uh, all that happened was there were new rules that were implemented uh, in order to be able to supposedly protect women. Uh, I mean, we mentioned some of these things. We said that uh, rules such as uh, protection within the home, the covering up uh, of women's from outward gazes, and often enough, Muslims will use these uh, in a positive tone. Uh, would you say that? Is this a positive thing? when you uh, protect a woman by keeping her away from men and society? Well, uh, not every Muslim would think that way, especially in the West, but your most traditional Muslim societies would. And certainly if you, you base it on the example of, of Muhammad, um, yes. then, then you, you would have to, and, and also on what the Quran says, then yes, the, the women do need to be separated and segregated. But I would say that how is it ennobling to not give women choice? Women should have the choice to whether they should go out mm. or whether they stay home, whether they drive or whether they don't drive, whether they get a career, whether they don't get a career, yes. whether they get married, whether they don't get married. Women must have a choice. And it all, and that is ennobling. And yes. actually, the God of the Bible does that. Um, a fantastic verse to read is, is Proverbs 31. Uh, and it's, it's, it, this, the, the, this Bible passage is brilliant just to sum up um, a woman. And it talks about a mother. And it, it doesn't necessarily say that a, a noble woman is just a mother, but it's given the idea that she's a mother, she's a family woman, she has a career. She goes out and she um, estab establishes her career. She buys a, 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 a field and she, she makes, a, mm, makes sure that food, she, it's, yes. it becomes successful. Yes. Um, but her family's okay as well. Her husband is respected at the gates and this woman is respected as well in the public realm. Mm. The woman is respected at the city gates. She's out, she's doing her business, she's doing her career, and she's in the home. So this, it just shows that a woman can do whatever God wants her to do. And it could be just a career. It could be just being a mother. It could be both. It could be um, any sort of um, vocation that, that whether you're inside the home, out the side of the home, or both. Yes. And that's the, that's the Christian woman. That's the biblical woman. Yes. And I think some of these things we can refer even to uh, the uh, the position of the Samaritan woman. I mean, Jesus didn't say to her, you know, what are you doing away from your house? Absolutely. You yeah. shouldn't be talking to me. I mean, you mentioned that, you know, why aren't you covered up or why aren't you segregated? Why haven't you separated yourself, you know, from me? Um, but they're conversing and they're talking and Jesus bypasses all these things and he goes straight to the heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. And the heart of the matter was her relationship with God. Uh, you know, he corrected her in showing her because, you know, the Samaritans believed that you had to worship on a particular mountain, but it was at Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, look, there's coming a day where you will neither worship on this mountain or that ma mountain, but if you want to worship the Father, the Father, you need to worship him in spirit and in truth. Yes. And that day is now. Yes. And so, you know, her problem was her salvation, her sins. And I think, I mean, I would really love for our Muslim brothers and sisters to really come back to that. I mean, we can yeah. speak about so many different things and they're very important uh, subjects. However, what is our relationship like with God? Do we know him? Have we asked him to forgive us? Do we know him as a father? 
you know, and so Jesus, you know, he doesn't enter into all these small things, even though they might be important, but he goes straight to the, the heart of the matter. And that's why I think so many other religions that have rules and regulations, uh, including Islam, and, uh, and, and uh, have a certain pract practice of life, and it's, and it's rigid, uh, if it doesn't lead you to the Savior, if it doesn't teach you um, how to worship in spirit and truth, what is the point of these rules and regulations? Yes. It's got to lead you to the God who saves. And that's what Jesus did when he interacted with all these different kinds of women. Yes, so are there any examples of perhaps maybe what we might deem to be or classify as a female leader uh, in the Bible? There are quite a few examples of women um, in, in quite leadership positions in different contexts. Um, right from the beginning of the Bible, you have Deborah. Yes. Um, in, uh, Deborah was in the Old Testament and she, in the book of Judges, four, in chapter 4 and 5. And she um, was a woman who led an army of men and, and rescued the people of God uh, because um, God raised her up to do this. You have female prophetesses as well. Um, you have Philip's daughter. Um, Philip's daughter's prophesying in the book of Acts. You've got Hulda in the Old Testament in 2 Kings where the men go to her and they want a message from God. And so Hulda gives this message from God and she was a prophetess. You have um, female testifiers. When Jesus died, um, the people who told him, um, told others about the resurrection of Jesus was women. I mean, this is against culture completely. Yes. Again, the New Testament writers went above culture. Women testifiers. Yes. There's example after example through the New Testament. Yes. Beth, we've come to the end of the episode. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. <laughs> we've been able to discuss on this episode the position of women before and after Islam. We've been able to compare or contrast how Jesus treated women with how Muhammad treated women. We hope that you're able to go away and study these things for yourself. Until then, please stay tuned for the very next episode of Midnight Cry.